Hi, this is David Gronoski, host of A Neighbor's Choice and Things Hidden Podcast, as well as some of our other programs like Science and You with our Chief Science Advisor, Dr. You, and our Seed Oil Survival Series that we continue to have great fun unpacking the truth of nutrition. I wanted to give you a quick little message saying that we appreciate all the support that we get from our monthly contributors and our one-time donation supporters, and we'd encourage all of you to go to our website, a neighborschoice.com, click on contribute and make a monthly pledge today, whether it's a dollar, $5, 15, 20, 50, whatever you want to do, doesn't matter. Just be a part of building this new media project that we've developed to empower and inform, to inspire, to kickstart a scientific renaissance, an anthropological breakthrough and reformation in the church. All these things are possible with your support right now. So make that commitment today and help us keep doing the productions that we have. Thank you. I'm David Gronoski, and we're here for another Seed Oil Survival podcast as our series continues to investigate what we believe to be one of the key drivers of chronic diseases and even problems with acute infectious diseases, and that is seed oils and high PUFA foods in general. And joining me is someone who's been a pioneer research researcher in this subject matter, as well as a host of other things related to ancestral health. We have with us Suzanne Alexander. How are you doing? Hi, David. It's so wonderful to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and it's great to have you on. We've uh, gotten to know each other over the years, but this is our first time doing a discussion on the podcast in front of the public, so we're going to have a lot of fun. But you, are, you're, hold, uh, you're holding my hand, Dave, because this is my first my first um, podcast, so thank you. Well, you've been uh, a mover uh, oftentimes, you know, of course, behind the scenes, behind a lot of the research and, and different ideas that have come out of this space um, as people become more aware of the science of seed oils, the science of high PUFA diets, and other various, um, you know, additives and processed foods that uh, are causing problems in, in, uh, in the Western diet today. But, you know, I met you through our mutual friend, Dr. Chris Kenobi, who's an MD and someone who's been on my program several times. He's uh, authored a book that you've co-authored with him called The Ancestral Diet Revolution, which we talked about recently on the show. So it's great to have the other author of this great uh, book on uh, for a further discussion on the subject. Dave, thank you so much. I just I appreciate the time that you're giving us and that you support our our mission, our efforts, and I I just it's just such an honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and now you are um, someone with a lot of experience and education. That's your background, and you've applied it to the subject matter, ancestral health. You were uh, for many years into a uh, vegetarian or vegan diet, right? Yes, for decades. And, yes. and why did you, how many decades were you in it and why did you get out? Oh, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good story. Um, that's a long one. I'll, I'll, I'll try to condense it. Um, since I was born, I've had, I've struggled, extremely struggling with, with my health. Um, I mean, I've lost my life, I almost lost my life a couple of times because of my health. Um, when I was two, starting back at two, um, my, I was rushed to the hospital because my temperature got to be 106 and there was nothing that would bring it down. And the only thing that they had left to do was they put me in ice and um, eventually the Lord saved me and, um, and I survived that one. Um, Maybe it did a little bit to my brain. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little weird. <laughs> so maybe that was a little brain damage got done there. But um, and then ever since that at that, that point, um, my, my dad also was born with many, many, many um illnesses, and I think I inherited a lot of them. And um, one being celiac, and he he was never diagnosed with it. And I was just recently diagnosed when I was 57, and I'm 62 now. And um, but we we never knew it, and so I the the pain. I struggled with every single day after eating was horrible. Um, anyone who's had celiac, it's, it's, um, it's not pleasant. And um, that's a great, that's triggered by the gluten, right? Yes. Yeah. The gluten. And um, 
for me, it's not just the wheats and, and the, bar, the, the, you know, the barley and those kinds of things. It's also corn. It's any kind of grain. I cannot handle any kind of grain. Um, and, and then on top of that, I've got so many other allergies that I didn't realize I had. Um, and, um, and then I have a very rare, a very, very rare um, syndrome. And it's called the retrograde cryopharyngeus, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right, dysfunction or the no burp syndrome. And I just thought, I thought it wasn't rare. I thought a lot of people don't burp. And, um, and it, you're probably thinking, the, the, the viewers are probably thinking, well, what is this no burp syndrome? And um, it's, you can't burp. And the, the air gets trapped and it can't come out of the stomach, it can't come through the esophagus, it, it can't release. And so there's no pressure. And so when, you, when you're with someone, and there's only a few of us, but if you've got it, you know it, and um, you're not alone. And, um, but there's different levels of it. And my daughter also inherited, my oldest daughter also inherited it, but she doesn't have the severe kind. I have the extreme severe, of course, lucky. And what happens is, is um, after you eat, it, you just hear all the sound, it's gurgling, and it's because it's trying so hard to, to release, but it has no place to go. Um, and so some people can, can, you know, <laughs> exit the back door. I can't, it, it literally trapped in my chest. And so you'll hear it. Even if I drink water, you'll hear the, like it's like there's something living in there. And sometimes it will get so severe that I'll get these unbelievable hiccups that are so painful. It's like someone literally is slamming you in the chest every time you hiccup and you can't stop. And eventually it becomes so horrible that you go into a violent vomiting to be able to try to stop the pain. Um, and so that's the, that's the severity of what I get when I sometimes eat things. Oh, like a satanic, devious little condition. It, it, it's horrible. It's horrible. And now they've come up with a thing that they can actually go in and they will take Botox and inject down into a, an area of, the, of the, the, the larynx. I'm not sure what it is, but it's, it's I don't really want to be a guinea pig. <laughs> So I'm thinking, you know, and, and now that I've, I've got, I've removed so many plants from my life. Um, it's not as bad. I don't, I only get, I mean, yes, you can still hear the sounds and everything, but the hiccuping and the vomiting. Um, I think the last time I had it was probably a year and a half ago and Chris got to experience it. <laughs> and he, he said, I've never seen anything so awful in my life, you know, and that's, and of course I didn't know, I didn't know there was a name to it. Chris was the one that found it. He said, wow. there's something not right here. There's just something not right. So he looked it up and he goes, there's actually a name. He goes, you're not alone. He goes, it's rare, but you know, and then, you know, and my daughter, of course he has it. So it is definitely inherited things. So I, and I said to my mom, I said, mom, did you ever hear dad burp? I said, I don't recall him burping. I said, everyone, I said, most men go, let out a good burp. You know what I mean? So my, my youngest daughter lets out a good burp. But, and I said, I don't ever recall dad ever burping. And she's like, I don't know, I never thought about it. So I wonder if he had it because he had terrible, terrible uh, digestive problems like I do. I also, when I was in my younger years, I had a hiatal hernia. If you ever had a hiatal hernia, it's horrible. Now I was also an opera singer. And at one point in my early twenties, when I was, that was my, my, my highlight of my career, um, I was, you know, with studying with Beverly Sills and in, in the New York City Opera, I was at the Montreal Opera. and and at that point, I kept losing my voice and I, I was doing pageants and I was performing all over, but I kept losing my voice. So they went down my, they went down to check. First, they went in my, my, my nose and they went down with a camera and they saw that my vocal cords were fried to burn up. And they said, you got, there's got to be some, some either acid reflux, hiatal hernia. So then they did the upper GI and I have a hiatal hernia. And um, so then they wanted to put me on Prilosec and um, I took one pill and I threw it up. It was horrible. Um, but throughout most of my life as a child, because I was in such pain all the time with indigestion and not knowing that there was a hernia going on in there, I was living on Tums. I was literally just popping Tums as my father always was. I mean, we would go through bottles of Tums. Um, and, and of course, then with the, with the celiac, um, I had such constipation. Oh, David, it was, I would go weeks without going to the bathroom and the pain, I would just be sobbing at nighttime. The pain was so bad. And when I would go, it was kind of like, if you've ever seen a rabbit or a deer, when, when they <laughs> have a bowel movement, they're little pellets and only like three would come out. I'd be, where, where's all this, where's the food? 
Where's it all and going? This was this horrible vegan diet that you were doing. No, you? this is not. No, I wasn't a vegan oh. yet. I wasn't. I was just eating processed food. Okay. I was eating all processed food. You, so you tried to get the veganism to solve it, and it yes, just made or, more problems. Yes. Right? And it, so I got rid of the dairy. So I got into my twenties. I got rid of the dairy. I got rid of. Um, started taking out meat. I started slowly taking things out because the migraines were so horrible. I had just so many awful ailments, and so then um, I, I was. I felt pretty good. So for about 25 years, I was feeling unbelievable, David. I will, I'm honestly going to say as a vegan, I was unstoppable. I, I felt so great. Yes, I had my, my, you know, retrograde, you know, I had my burp, no burp syndrome, but, um, but everything else, you know, my hiatal hernia had gone away. I had that test. It was gone. That had healed. Um, I just felt really good, but I was still doing grains. I was still doing grains. I did think about, cause I love pasta. Golly, I love pasta. I could eat an entire box full of pasta every day. It was, I could, I just loved it. You have like an Italian background? No, no. <laughs> but I just, and I, and I, and I, I was, I'm always so hungry. It just felt like it could kind of fill me up, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm very small. I'm 5'8. And right now I weigh 110. At my lowest point, I was 95 pounds and I was eating 3,000 calories a day with, as a vegan. Uh -huh. I, I couldn't get enough nutrients. I couldn't absorb it. It would just go through me. It would just go through me. And, um, so then, um, then I went, instead of, I was, I was cooking, uh, cooking raw, vegan, uh, cooking vegan, but then I became a raw vegan when I turned 50. And, uh, and that's why I took it in my hands. My, my, I was getting worse arthritis. Oh, my hands and my feet, I, the pain was horrible. And so I thought grains, I got to take all the grains out. And within day, with like two days, the pain was gone. Wow. The pain was, I was like, Oh, it's a miracle. Oh my golly! I don't I don't have arthritis. It's just the, it's the grains. Um, so I didn't. I, that was fabulous. But then um, I would say a few years into the raw vegan, I started noticing things. Just I didn't feel optimum. I didn't feel my optimum, and um, so I just I just kept thinking I I maybe I'm getting older. Maybe I'm getting older. But I know God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. And so um, then I got to around, oh, oh, I got to tell you the story about my first colonoscopy as a vegan. This may be too much information, but it's really, really important, guys. <laughs> so at 50, I go in thinking, I'm eating the most perfect diet. I'm a vegan. You know, this is, it's, it's so perfect. It's so clean. Everything was organic. I mean, I didn't, no process. I haven't done seed oils probably since I lived with my parents, which was what almost 50 years ago yeah so anyway so i i go in and the, the after the procedure's done the doctor comes in i go was it just so clean squeaky clean and he's like honestly i can't tell you and i said what does that mean he goes your entire colon was embedded with nuts and seeds i couldn't see a thing except nuts and seeds wow and i'm like well, what does that mean he goes whoever told you to eat nuts and seeds humans can't digest them and I said, well, wait, but I'm working on my doctorate. I'm working in health and nutrition. And those are power foods. So no, they're not. You can't digest them. Don't eat them. So that's my kind of started. It was in the back of yeah, my mind. Yeah, they're trying to convince people to eat like a squirrel. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, maybe I'm wrong here. But I kind of put that to the back of my head. You know, I'm thinking, oh. But then I'll fast forward to when I turn 60. And now at this point, I was mostly mostly carnivore. I had a little bit of, I, I, I do a little bit of plants, a little bit of fruit, um, but mostly meat. And so I go to my gastroenterologist and I said, okay, I, oh, I, I eat mostly meat. Well, now you do realize that, that, that that's known to be a carcinogen. I said, well, I don't believe it is. Let's see what happens. So after the, the test was done, comes in with the nurses with him and says, um, I said, how was it? That's one of the most pristine looking colons I've ever seen. He goes, not one polyp, clean as can be. So all the nurses are like, what do you eat? I said, mostly meat. They're like, you mean we can go home and we can tell our husbands that they can finally eat meat? What kind of meat? I said, mostly wild bison at that time. And they're like, red meat? It doesn't have to be white meat, it can be red meat. <laughs> so they were ecstatic, they were ecstatic, David. And so, um. Yeah, so that was just kind of neat to see the difference between what was happening in my colon with plants versus having the meat. It was clean. 
So um, I just thought that was pretty swell. So anyway, so um, yeah. So then uh, when I got, when I turned, when I turned 57, my blood work became really devastating. And I was, I'm a guinea pig on myself, everyone. So I've been testing myself since I was 20. I've been trying to figure out what's wrong. I just know God doesn't make mistakes. Why do I feel not? Why is this? Why is that? And so I've been searching for all these years to find what's right for me. We all had to find what's right for each of us. You know, I can't tell you what's right for you. I can, I can guide you in terms of telling you my story, but we have to listen to our own bodies. And just because if something works really well for someone else, doesn't mean it's going to work for somebody else. You know, we've all, we've all got our different genetic, just like when we raised wild animals when I was growing up, you know, my father was a, an animal, wild, real life, wild animal life rehabilitationist. And um, we would take little babies whose mothers had been killed in, the, in by cars and so forth. And people would bring them to our home and we would raise them. And my father would always say to me, Suze, when I started at five, he, when I went to school, he said, um, find books in the library about whatever, you know, so it was a raccoon or a skunk or a fox or a deer, whatever we had. And we've got to find their species specific diet. And so we would come home, I'd sit in his lap and I would read with him about what they ate, how they lived, what their lifestyle was, what their habitats. And we learned so much. And here I'm a sick little girl. My father's a sick man. And the more and more I kept watching the animals, I lived with them. They were my life. They were my best friends. They taught me how to climb trees. You know, it just they taught me everything. And I thought, they're not eating what we're eating. They're not eating Captain Crunch. They're not drinking Tang. They're not eating fruit cocktail out of a can. They're eating beautiful food from the earth. They're out trapping things. I'm down by the creek with the, with the raccoons and they're in there grabbing crayfish or frogs, whatever they can get. So I said to dad, when I would turn 10, and I said, dad, do you think that what we're eating is causing us to be sick? And he looked at me and he goes, I don't know. I never thought about it. I said, because the animals are eating our food. And maybe if we eat like they did, maybe we wouldn't be so sick. So I said, if that's the case, dad, I said, then could it be that the food we're eating is making us sick? I said, do we rethink what we're eating? So he pondered that and let it go. But I never let it go because I was so sick. And so I kept trying to figure this out. I kept trying to figure this out. And so it's been my quest my whole life to figure out what is the, the species specific diet, not just for our wild animals, but for humans, because they were just thriving. And you it's know? certainly and, not tons of nuts and seeds. and None. No, they, I mean, they, they eat, with, well, we had, we did, well, okay, we had a, a, a squirrel. It was an older squirrel. And so whenever we would get, get the older animals that were injured, um, they were tricky. Um, and of course I was kind of a, a, a child that was, you know, they're not going to hurt me. And dad's like, don't put your hands in the cage with this one. Well, I know they're going to love me. So I put my hand, of course, bit my finger really bad. So I still got a nice little <laughs> scar from that squirrel, but squirrels are designed to eat nuts. Yeah. You know, I've got chipmunks in my backyard, that, especially my little Daisy that they come up on me and, and they, they, they they eat nuts and peanuts and things like that. That's what they do, but their body is designed for that. They're just they're yeah. specifically designed for that, but we aren't, I don't believe we are. Um, and I think if we are, I wouldn't eat too many of them for me. I can't, it just doesn't make me feel good. I feel horribly. I know that I have some friends who can eat it and they feel swell on it. They just feel phenomenal on it. Then if that's good for them, then it's something in their DNA helps them to be able to absorb it and, and, and not feel sick on it. I can't for me. Nuts and seeds don't do well with me. So again, we have to listen to ourselves and we're, we're kind of all like our own little species, although there is the main human, we are still human. Um, and I just think we have to listen to ourselves. We have to listen. And um, again, what's right for one person is not maybe not right for somebody else. Do you guys have badgers too? No, reading? no, but we have like, um, we had woodchucks. Um, we had all different kinds in my, in my backyard. Groundhog. Is that the same that as a gro groundhog? Yeah, yeah, groundhog. Yeah. 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 And, um, so yeah, we have a groundhog. Her name is Marge in my backyard and, um, and her son lives up front. And, uh, so, um, yeah, and they were just beautiful. My favorite of the animals of the wild animals was always the raccoons. I, I just, they were just so magnificent. Um, I would just carry them around with me and they would just, 
they taught me to climb trees and I had, and I They're had almost two- monkey like with their little, they, oh, and yeah. in, but in, almost humanoid. And they would, they yeah. loved it. They would climb up on you. They would like, they'd come in the house and they'd hang out with us on the couch and stuff. And they climb up and they look in your ear and they open your mouth and they're trying to stick their hands. And they're looking, they're very always looking and looking through your hair, very much like a monkey would do yeah. going through your hair. And, and, um, and I, had two rats. My, I, had, I had many rats, but my two favorite rats were, were Bill and Barney. And um, so whenever we would climb trees, I'd put Bill in one sleeve and I put Barney in the other sleeve. Yeah. And so the raccoons would go up the tree and I'd follow them with my rats and my sleeves and we'd just hang out in the tree. And One time when I was uh, camping on an island in, off of uh, Florida, there my I, I was a little tall for the for the tent we were in and my my head was kind of pushing out of the tent, you know, texture. Out, you know, like oh my God. against the tent canvas, and I remember that night I kept having these horrible. Uh, I couldn't sleep because I kept having these recurring nightmares that there was alien creatures like probing my head, and it was little raccoons actually, <laughs> who were you know they could feel my head through the tent canvas, and they kept grabbing their little claws and you know grabbing around to see what that was. And they do, and they're very, and they're very nosy, very inquisitive. And if they can't figure it out, though, it's one why they didn't try to eat through the the, the tent. And really, it's yeah, amazing. I think they were or something. I felt yeah. like I was being like my <laughs> head was being chewed, and and by alien, it was in my dream. It was like some kind of alien creature, and it was just I realized it was raccoons. But, um, <laughs> they're so adorable. Oh my goodness! But again, if they, they can be very wild, and they can be yeah. very mean, very very mean if they don't. So like we we'd have friends come over, and if they sense you didn't like animals, their fur they would, you know, they would just they don't. Same with our skunks. Our skunks were very you know territorial and very protective. Um, so you wouldn't want to you know make them angry because you don't want to get sprayed by a skunk. But um, we we only had one incident with that, and that was a dog that stared one of the skunks. And they eat a lot of nuts and seeds too, skunks. <laughs> Not not as much they they do they they will eat those things but but they like berries they like yeah. you know they like um you know but they do like you know frogs and and insects and they're 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 very much like humans I mean they can eat animal and they can eat plants you know they're not they're not picky um but with the, with the raccoons their hand they're very clean and scientists I think are still trying to figure this out. Many people just think that they're very clean. So that we would always put water out. If they didn't go down to the stream, we always had a bowl of water out so that they could wash whatever they would find, what they're going to uh. eat. They would wash it. But there's some research saying that some people are thinking that they don't know if it's because they were washed to clean it, or is it because they have special sensors in their hands that they're just trying to, it's, they're sensing, they're sensing their food. It's with sensing. Uh. I thought, well, that's pretty nifty, but maybe it's both of them. Maybe they're doing both. Cause like, I know I use my hands a lot to eat my food with as well. And um, there's just something about the texture and just feeling it. I think that it's, um, it's kind of like when I'm crawling, I crawl a lot every day outside in, in the dirt and the mud and the grass and so forth. And I, so I'm using my bare foot and I'm using my hands getting dirty. And there's just something about the feeling. It just, um, it just, it, it makes my body alive. It, I yeah. feel that. I think it's, 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 I know it's the positive energy and stuff too, but there's also the, 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 the dirt is the, 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 the it's the microbes and so forth. It's, there's so much going on in the earth. We don't even know about. And, um, and I know my neighbors think I'm nuts out there crawling around and, you know, jumping and all the cartwheels and all the things I'm doing out there. But um, there's just something about touching the ground and touching dirt and touching our food. And I think that sometimes it's so good to put that silverware down you know, I tell that to my granddaughter, just put your so far down, just use your hands, get dirty, you know, eat your food. I, so, I, you know, I, I pick up my meat and I'm just, you know, I'm, it's sort of just dripping down my hand, you know, it's, it's, um, we're humans, enjoy being human, doesn't mean you have to be so perfectly clean. Um, so there's just something about touching our food. And I, again, that goes back to the raccoons. I, I just watched them, I marveled at watching them as a little girl, what, growing, growing up. And I just, I thought they, they know how to live. We don't. We have right. to be told what to do, but they don't, yeah. you know, I'm trying to get back to my roots. What, what, what really, how are we supposed to live? It was the same thing when my grandmother, um, she taught in Liberia for two years with the tribe. And then she was in Nigeria for another year. And when she would come home and tell the stories of living with them and the beauty of it, the food that they were eating, how alive they were, they just the lived. The food or the people? Everything she said that the like she talked about the first time that she sat the first time she sat with a chief 
when she was first welcomed into the, the village. And um, I'm, I'm sitting at her lap, you know, just couldn't believe I, she's going to tell me these stories. And she said, and I remember so I'm sitting next to him and I want to impress him. You know, she says, you always have to do what, what, the, what the natives do. She says, you have to do exactly what they, what they you wear what they wear and you eat what they're going to eat because otherwise it's slap, it's slap to their integrity. And, and so she said, you know, they would bring out these, everything on wood, wood, I think it's made out of wood. It's nothing, but we would think it's just these wood platters or whatever. And she said, and the food was meat and they had some, you know, potatoes and they had, you know, different things that they would grow or they would find in the woods, you know, tubers and things. And then she said, and then they were all getting really excited. <laughs> and it was time for dessert. <laughs> she goes, I assumed it was their dessert. So she says, I'm thinking, what do they eat for dessert? So I'm like, oh my gosh, grandma, what do they eat? And she says, well, they're all like, and they're watching me and they're watching my face. And she says, and I couldn't believe what they brought in front of me. I'm like, Damn, grandma, grandma, what is it? And she said, it's a, the head of a monkey that was just killed. The top of the head had been cut off. So the brains, fresh brains are showing. And she said, they have like a, this wooden kind of a, kind of like a spoon. And she says, and they hand it to me and they're all smiling, you know, like, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Grandma, did you eat it? And she said, well, here's this monkey looking at me. I said, its eyes were open. She said, yeah. And she said, and the chief's watching me. And she said, I knew I had to. I knew I had to. I said, Grandma, you're so brave. And she put her spoon in and she said, and she ate it. And I said, how did it taste? And she said, it wasn't as bad as I thought. She said, I actually took a few spoonfuls. And she said, and they were all so happy. They were all, oh, you know. <laughs> and um, she says it was still warm because it was just freshly killed. So she said it was, it was just still a warm brain, you know, the, the temperature of that, that monkey. And so um, from that moment, the moments of her stories, David, I just was in awe. And I said, this is my life. I have to find the truth. I have to find, I don't want to be sick anymore. They're not sick. I bet they don't have, I bet they don't have diseases. Like I don't bet they're not, I bet their children aren't sick like I am. And so now that's what we'll talk about next. <laughs> yeah. So you you kind of you've you came to the conclusion that seed oils are driving most of the problems in our chronic diseases and obesity and cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's. Oh, and my mother's disease, yeah, and my mother, my mother, my mother's blind with yeah. PMD, you know, yeah. with next generation. And um, she's centrally blind and she's 91, but she's she's lost her vision in her 70s. Yeah. And, um and it's for not. Right. It, it it shouldn't have happened. My father's he's passed away from cancer, from prostate cancer, uh -huh. spread through his body. That was for not. You know, um, there's just so many diseases that again, I've always said it's the disease of greed that we all that everyone has because it's the pharmaceutical companies, it's the the big food companies. They just they don't care. They just let's just keep feeding this this garbage. Let's not tell uh -huh. the truth. It's so simple. We just eat what God put on this earth, what he created for us, you know, and he's, we've got the beautiful animals. And I know I was vegan. I was vegan. And, um, and I love animals. They're, they're, they were my life and they, I just love them. But those animals also kill animals. Yeah. I watch them. They kill animals. Viciously. 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 It's violent. Do you think that eating animals is a type of sacrificial violence? Is it a type of sacrifice? Um, some people, I, I, I suppose you could look at that. So when you could you look at parts of the Bible, you know, they would sacrifice the lamb. There was always a, there's something sacrificial. It could be that way, possibly. Um, I know that before I eat, I'm always thankful. And I always thank the animals, the Native Americans. I, I'm, I have Native American in my, my, my blood. And um, I always thank the animals for giving their life. I think the plants for giving their life. I think the farmers, the ranchers, the fishermen, the butchers, everyone who have worked so hard to bring us our food. Yeah. And I think it's important to always give thanks. We have to be so thankful for everything that we have, everything that has been blessed, we've been blessed with. Even hard times. There's been a lot of difficult times in life, but doesn't that make us better people? Right. We appreciate things, you know, and um but the key issue, so it's the seed oils driving much of the diseases. Uh, much of the diseases are caused by this. There's, there's of course, the processed grains that everybody's talking about that you mentioned. It's eating seeds and nuts. 
uh, eating too many um, plant foods in terms of some of these things are going to pick up oxalates, which we can't get into right now. But, but even we these... talked about earlier, David, yeah. feeling heavy metals. Yeah, I mean, people from, from, from kale, right? So you're kale, killing, loaded. Uh, are you still getting it when you cook it, or does the cooking it get rid of it? it? It it will get rid of some. It will. They will. It will leach them. Yeah. It will leach them out. Yeah. Anytime you're cooking, but when you're eating them raw, which most so the worst thing you want to do is eat raw vegan. That's one of the worst yes, diets you can which do. Which is what I did. I did. Yeah, it. Unfortunately. Um, so uh, now we're going to go to what's in store next, as Dr. Chris Kenobi and you are about to embark on an exciting journey. So let's see. Um, we have some images here. Let's. Now, David, do, you, do you have you have the first image that was on um, the the map? Do you, do you have? The yeah, map? let's look at the map. Let's look at the map so we can kind of see where we're heading. Okay, let's see here. Or, or even the, the first one, the title one that kind of tells what we're doing, <laughs> kind of gives the ta da. <laughs> right. We're so excited, you guys! It's so it's just so nifty. Okay, so we have this map. Yeah. All right, Tell so, us a little bit about your what you guys are doing. So, guys, this is the a map of the. Pacific Islands. And um, and if you've read our book or if you've watched any of Dr. Kenobi's videos or, or heard him speak, um, present any, any of the all over the world he's, that he talks, we've, he talks about many of the, the islands and the people who inhabit these beautiful islands and their, the food that they eat. And he ta- we, in our book, we talked about, um, we talked about like the Tukusinta and we talked about like in Papua New Guinea that um that we had people who were mostly living on the sweet potato about 90 percent of their diet sweet potato right. and um at times they might have a pig feast um and but that would be very often wasn't every week wasn't every day um and but most of the time they had a huge variety of sweet potatoes and that was their main staple and so and they were pristine they had wonderful health they had very little uh, disease, chronic disease. Um, and so when we look at the- calories, do they know how many calories they're eating on average there? We don't know. Um, I'm not sure. No, if Chris were here, you'd probably rail it right yeah. off. Um, I'm not a numbers girl. <laughs> Sorry guys. But, um, no, I, I would, you know, for me, um, and of course I will know soon because I'm going to, now I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Um, on Friday, I'm going to be leaving for our, um, what we're calling our um, Pacific Island Research Ex- First Expedition 2023. And so we're gonna be flying. I'm gonna meet Chris, he's in uh, Australia right now because he was at the Low Carb Down Under uh, convention this weekend. And um, so I'm going to be meeting him this weekend. And then from there, we're going to fly. Our first island will be to where, where you see the green, Papua New Guinea, and that's in part of Malaysia. So I, I I wanted this map up here because I wanted you to see that you've got the yeah. Micronesia, Melanesia, you got Polynesia, and then of course you can see that you were Australia and so forth is. So we'll be flying from Australia. We'll be in Melbourne, and from Melbourne we're going to go to near near Papua New Guinea to Papua, which is Jaipura. In Jaipura, that's in in Indonesia. Okay, there that's where we're going to land. We're going to fly there first, and then um, so. In, and that's more of a city kind of an area. So therefore we're going to be able to go and we're going to be able to meet the people who are living in the city, the cohorts from the people who are living ancestrally. And so we'll be able to see how they look. We'll be able to talk to them. We'll be able to go in, into their stores and see if we're seeing seed oils. Are we seeing Twinkies? Are we seeing boxes of cereal? Um, are we seeing new fast food restaurants? What are we going to see when we're there? And then we're going to take a small little plane that's going to take us up into the mountains, the highlands, and we're going to go and we're going to meet the Dani or the Denai. I'm not sure how they're going to pronounce it. I'll let you know while we're there. And, and that's in Papua New Guinea still or somewhere else? That's, that's in, it's called Wamina. And it's, it's, it's in the, the western side of, of, of Papua, Papua. Okay. So it's all within that region, but it's, it's kind of, it's it's we'll say it's in that same region all right and so then but when i'm there i'll have more details i'll be showing you guys right exactly where we are i'll, I'll pinpoint it for you and so um so what we're going to spend about three or four days meeting the, the tribe we've got a guide that will be taking us and um i it's just gonna be so beautiful so profound 
um, because they do live mainly on sweet potatoes still. And um, I've requested of our guide um, many special things that I've been thinking my whole life as a little girl, could he ask them to take us to certain, to do certain things with us. And so um, I'm not gonna tell you now what they're gonna be, but they're gonna be so beautiful and so informative. And um, it will answer so many of your questions that we have about what is the, the, the spe human specific diet, the species diet. Um, that thing is just what they're eating because we're gonna see it other, other tribes as well. Um, because there's multiple, there's multiple ways. And we, and you, as you've seen, if you watch Dr. Kenobi on, on many of his presentations, he's shown, if you go to see the Maasai, which we will be doing, we will be going to, to study with them as well. Um, we will be going to Costa Rica and studying as well there. Uh, we're going is that to all on the same uh, trip or those are in the future? No, no, because it just takes, a, this is our yeah. first, we're just getting our, yeah. our feet wet. So this one, we're not going to be doing any kind of blood work. We're not doing any, any lab work at all. We're trying to just go and see what it's going to take for us to really do this kind of investigation. And when it gets to the point where it's going to be extremely intense, where we will be, you know, but we have to go and get permission from the government to do all those kinds of things. It's very intensive. It's so much paperwork. It's so expensive. Just the lab work alone and having what we're going to have to do and send it to special labs, everything, it's going to be unbelievable. Uh, and the cost is exorbitant. This trip alone is extremely expensive and we're keeping, and I'm, I'm, I'm such a, a frugal person. And that's why Chris has me orchestrating this whole, this whole trip, because he knows I, I'm, I go with, stay so within an off. So you're going to be staying just in Papua New Guinea on this trip. No, no, oh. no, no. We're going to seven different islands on this trip. So everything's going to be very fast. We're moving very quickly. Um, Are you guys going to go to Nauru? No, I'm going to show you where we're going. So the next one, after Papua New Guinea, well, after we, from Wamina, then we'll fly back to Jaipura because, again, this is the most difficult part about organizing this trip for me, was trying to find planes that will actually take us to where we need to go. And the yeah. flights are really crazy. And I met some wonderful people um, that were just amazing in helping to, to teach me how to find the flights. So after Papua New Guinea or Jaipura, Jaipura and Wamina, we're going to then fly to Honiara. We're going to go to the Solomon Islands. So that's over here. I don't know if you see the little strip of islands over uh, here. Okay. And Honiara is um, uh, it's the main city in that region. And so that's where the air, that's where the, where the, the main airport, the international airport will be. We'll fly into that region. And so from there, we'll be able to kind of, um, there's, a, there's this huge market there. It's known for their huge marketplace where all the people in the region come for, with all their, their produce that they grow. Sometimes you'll find um, also wild boar will be there, a lot of fish. So they've got a lot of animals and things. You might see cattle being taken down through the street that they might be bringing. Um, so they do have animals that they, they actually, they do eat animals there. They do, because they're not high up in, in the lands um, like we were with, with, the, with the Mina and the Dani, Dani tribe. Um, but you'll see, um, but the Dani also do eat, they do eat wild boar. The ones we were talking about over in Papua New Guinea, they do. But again, we'll show you all this over there. Um, so in Solomon Islands, we'll be looking there at the different um, the people who are living in the city and the people who are still living as ancestrally as we hope that they still are. Our fear is there's a possibility in my research that I've been doing and studying this is that I believe there's a very good chance that we have had a lot of our food infiltrating our um, processed food is infiltrating this region. I don't, I think a lot of the um, ancestrally living people, we'll see. I don't know how ancestrally living they're living now. That's how the Solomon Islands are talking about. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, I I don't have a good feeling from what I've been gathering in my studies. Why? Did you, did it, was there a McDonald's right at the tribal region you're going to? Well, no, but it's easy for them to get to, or it's easy for people to bring it to them. And this is my biggest concern is that while I'm there with Chris as well, is to try to educate any people that I see trying to bring them this processed food, thinking that it's really swell. Oh my gosh, they, they want to have these lollipops. They want to have this candy. They, they they think that they're doing them, they're giving them something that's so, but it's awful. And then we're, I, I'm hoping that our, our guides can also talk to the, 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 the people, the native people, and talk to them that, that this isn't good. I, I hope to educate them as well that don't, don't fall for this. There's nothing, this is not beautiful. This is not beautiful food. You know, don't, don't change your, your, what you're doing. 
you know. And but so they're not at a level where they're like subsistence level where they need that food to to make their daily calorie intake, right? They shouldn't. They yeah. because they they still have everything is still there. Nothing that nothing is their land. There there are some islands that yes are are starting to erode, you know. But but this isn't one of them, and they should be able to still. But I do, I hope that they're not becoming like lazy. And just saying, well, this is easier and, and or becoming addicted to the sweets and all the different, the different, you know, how, how we become, you know. And so these are the things that we're going to be. It's a lot. But, of but, but look, to be fair, though, they could eat a tremendous amount of the sugar that we have in our Western diet if they're not eating the seed oils. And they shouldn't have yeah, absolutely. Really, yeah, they shouldn't have yeah. that much problems. Let's be but, clear. But yeah. if they're but it, what I'm seeing in my research. I think it's not it's not just the sugar they're getting the processed food they're getting you know all everything that comes with the seed oils it's all coming into that it's it's in the packaging you know yeah. so they're not just eating sugar because you know that's not what they're eating they're i i i fear yeah but we'll see we'll see um I'm, i keep praying on it that um i'm wrong and in this region and that they're still living ancestry but i know in the city area it was looking not too good from what I was seeing in terms of the people that I've been studying and, and um, we'll see again this, this time next week, stay tuned. Um, every day we'll be putting up, you know, sharing photos and videos and things. And I'll where, right. at, where will, where will you be sharing these things? Uh, I, I, most, I will do it across the board. I will do it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, so these will, those will always every day be and up. What are the, what are the, uh, account you know the follow pages okay, so it will be ancestral health foundation and curie md and um you can also go into mine suzanne alexander and um those you'll find there every day i will be putting something up it now again um friends um if we're in a remote location and we don't have cell service which is very possible we will try to get some place where we can find cell service and um at least post something um when we can and we're also the day a day ahead so right now, this time next week, it will be Tuesday for you, but it'll be Wednesday for us. No monkey brain ice cream. That's no. I'm putting that out there right now for you and Chris. Because I know you guys are going to be like Indiana Jones, but you got to be that much like Indiana Jones. Now. I get the off. I, if, if you're going to be videoing eyeball soup like Indiana Jones, we're going to have some, some, probably some scary people or scared people in the comments. <laughs> no, but I will be, I will be very, very appropriate with them and, and honor their, their traditions. Um, so then after we go to the Solomon Islands, then we're going to fly over to Samoa. And you can see that over in the, the, the purple region. I think that's purple. I'm a slightly colorblind. So I think that's purple. I don't think that's a bluish color. And that's Polynesia. So you can see Samoa right there near American Samoa. So we're going to go there and we're going to spend quite a bit of time there. And again, um, looking at the, the, the people in hopefully still living traditionally versus their cohorts who are no longer, who have moved more into a, a, a suburban type region where it's going to be possibly fast food restaurants and so forth. And again, we'll be investigating both of those things and we'll be keeping, collecting tons of data. And this will go towards further research and um, writings and um, scientific papers and future books. And, um, but we really want to teach you all um, what we're seeing happening and we hope it's it's beautiful we hope we still have ancestrally living people who aren't going to fall for what we've all fallen for so what and data after, will you be primarily collecting like interviewing them and, and looking at yeah, and we'll be going into stores and restaurants asking what they're cooking with what they're you know of course in the store you just look on a shelf and we can just see if it's the same things that we have um we're going to go to the fancy restaurants and we'll go in and ask them what are they what are they cooking with you know maybe it'll be coke maybe it's coconut oil because I know that they've got fresh coconuts there. And that's just a huge piece of their life is coconut. But I hope they haven't brought in the soybean, the cotton seed, the canola, all the, you know, I pray that that's not there. But we will know soon enough. Right. Um, and so then from Samoa, we're going to go to Vanuatu. So now we're going back over to the blue and in Melanesia. And you can see where Vanuatu is. Okay. And we'll look around there and see what, what same thing. Same scenario there. And then we're going to fly in a little tiny little plane to an island called Tana. And I don't know if any of you have seen the movie called Tana. It's about this tribe that we're going to go and visit. 
and um, we're going to go in and spend some time with them and we're going to find out are they still living ancestrally and we'll know soon enough and then after we go to Tana we will fly back to that because we have to fly back to Vanuatu because again these are little tiny little planes and may it sounds like it's an easy trip but many times to get to Samoa we may have to fly all the way back to Australia and then fly all the way back to Vanuatu it, you have to go all over the place to try to get back to the islands and it's a lot of flying we are going to be on planes for hours and hours and hours just to get to certain islands so after then we come back from Tana to Vanuatu then we fly to Fiji and there are actually some very old villages that have been there for uh, like two millennia that are still in existence. And we're going to go and, and talk with them. And of course, go to their cohorts into the, what we would call like a city, but more of a, a, a suburb area where, and see if there's going to be the fast food areas and um, what they're selling in their, in their stores. And um, that will be our last stop. So there will be seven islands in all and um and hopefully we can gather a lot of amazing data and and guys we're hoping um that we can generate a lot of interest to help us we have two foundations a nonprofit, and the only way we can make this happen is by the, the generous gifts that people are willing to offer us to help cover the costs and so we've we've gathered enough to cover this expense of this this trip um Chris and I are also putting some of our own money into this um, because we believe in it so much. Um, we don't make a dime. We lose money, but it's not losing. We're winning because we want to save lives. With every dollar that someone gives, Chris and I were talking about this the other night, with every dollar that someone shares, I think we're saving like 10 lives. Every dollar. Wow. So it's, it's truly rem it's remarkable and we are so grateful to those um people who have been donating to us and, and believe in us. And um, it's the same with our book. Now, this is our motto, seed oil free is the key to being disease free. And I really believe that. I think that if we can eradicate seed oils and go back to cooking ancestrally with tallow and lard and butter and coconut oil. Um, and, and even if you can find a good quality and I'm working on this project, this is a new project I'm working on after this. Um, I think you'll be happy with this new project I come up with if it's going to come out how I think it's going to come out. Um, I won't tell you that right now. I'll leave that as a little cliffhanger too. It's There's a, a specific oil. It's um, ancestral and it's been used throughout the Bible. I think that'll give you a good hint. And um, we're working on um, making it something that you won't have to be afraid of anymore to wonder, is it been adulterated or not? So um, does that make sense to you, David? Yeah. It's just what about a, palm oil, you know, that's that's a yeah, good that, separated fat. That, that is, but but again, then you're thinking about the devastation that's happening, you know, in, in different places. Um I I don't know. Um I I again I'm not really an oil person, but if this project I'm working on that Chris is excited that I that we're gonna do, um, I think that that would be a really and I think you have a picture of Chris here already on location. Let's see. Yeah. There, yeah, Chris is already there. No, guys, this is these are the, the beautiful warriors, aren't they? Just oh, these are the warriors from the Dene tribe. And um, we will be spending time with them. Um, again, I don't know if it's Danny, D-A-N-I or Danai. Um are these the ones that eat the sweet potato? Yes, potato? yeah, yeah. But many of them do. Many of them, many of the tribes that we will be visiting in this region still eat sweet potatoes, but they also will consume, these guys will consume wild boar. They will also consume if they've got a river up near them, that they will actually go and they'll look for like crawfish and they'll find whatever they can find and they will, they'll eat those. Um, so they are, they know, they know that they need those things. They know that their daily diet is going to be sweet potato. Now, how do they do it? They dice they, it, they, slice it, boil it, and steam it. And... I'm not going to, I'm not going to ruin it. You will see next week. <laughs> oh, you know what they eat? Or you know how they eat it already? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh. They're going to. We're going to show you. It's it's again something that I I asked our guide. I, we're giving it all away, David. <laughs> you gonna, you're, are you going to live stream it? Them cooking or something? Uh, well, again, where they are, I don't know if we'll have cell service, but I will be using my my phone. Um, 
and it's going to be, um, we're going to show where if we can't live stream it, we will show it as soon as we can find um, service. And now, if, you eat, if you eat a lot of sweet potatoes, will you grow horns out of your nose? Like, that? <laughs> no, no, but I just can't wait to see what, but oh my, it's going to be so exciting. Oh my golly. Oh my golly. It's going to be so amazing what you're going to see next week well, every, for the next, so we'll be gone. We'll be away for three weeks guys. And you'll be able to every day tune in and um, follow along with us and you'll be learning how ancestral people actually lived and you don't, we don't have to wonder anymore but in this section of the world now when we go and live with the Maasai and the Hadza and or the Inuit or whoever we're going to go and live with um, you will see that it's something different there's not one right diet as long as we're eating ancestrally and I think that that's the key, you know, find what works best for you, not for anybody else. And this is another, isn't he, isn't he just oh, such a gift? They're, they're just magnificent. And, um, and I just honor them. So there's just so much to the story. Um, wait till you hear the stories of the things that they do. If you look at their fingers right now, there's, you'll, you'll notice next week, we'll be talking about something that's, it'll take your breath away because you wonder they have such devotion to their family and you'll see a story that we're going to share next week that will just make you realize there's just so many things about how we live that we just take for granted and um i think not only will you come away with a, a whole new perspective about what food is but what living is and what really matters and who really matters. Um, this is a this isn't just a journey for Chris and myself to to learn about nutrition, but it's to learn about life and it's to learn about love and, and peace. We've got so many things happening right now in the world, and, and these here we have warriors that are trying to just stay alive. What blonde animal did they cut? to get that hair on their arms right there. I mean, it could have been, a, it could have been a wild boar. Cause I know that's, that's a, big, a blonde yeah. little boar. Yeah. I mean, it, I will know. I will, I will, I will. I hope that's not a David, human. I'm I gonna hope that's it. not human here. Dear God. Well, remember that one point, uh, many of these were cannibals in a time. Yeah. Well, that, that's blonde hair. That was pretty recent. So, <laughs> so I will let you know. I will, David, I will put that down on my questions. And, yeah. and guys, no, but don't, I don't know. You might not want to ask them that question. <laughs> Whose hair is that? They might say, well, we'll, we'll let me show you Margaret from a 50 years. <laughs> and they may look at mine and say, oh, you got plenty. We could use that. You know? <laughs> but anyway, um, give me but seriously, David, I will put that down. I've got a whole humongous list of, of questions. And guys out there watching, um, if you want, to share questions that you want me to, to, to take along with me. Um, and while we're there, you know, post them as I'm posting things, put them in the comments of, you know, could you ask this question? Because I'm asking things I have always wanted to ask since I was a little girl with my grandma. That now I can go, I'm going to be right there. I'm following her footsteps and I'm going to be right there asking the questions with Chris. And um, it's so exciting. And I so hope this is like the continuation of Weston Price's work. Yes, absolutely. We, it, so. we are like his accolades. We are just, we are such fans. And um, he's, he's, he's on our shoulder. He's coming along with us. And we are just so honored. And again, guys, this is our book and the Ancestral Diet Revolution. And we have it available in four different versions uh, on Amazon and all bookstores online all over the world. So you can get the full color in the hardcover book. The full color in paperback and black and white paperback. Personally, I've, I've written about th I've written about this in our in our um, social media. I wouldn't buy the black and white because the, our we've got over 180 um, graphs, charts, photographs that are so magnificent and so detailed. The black and white doesn't do them justice, and it makes it very difficult to read. So uh, if if you can, but we also have it in 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 um, the ebook. The ebook is spectacular i spent oh my golly if you only knew the time to make this so perfectly done and it's one of the first ebooks that is, has so many um um what do you call it where you can actually click on the a, a link linkable a linkable um 
text that will take you right to the, the, tra the chart or the graph or whatever it is. So they're linkable and you don't have to look for them. It'll take you right to it. And it took forever. And it's, it, it, it's never been done with uh, something this extensive. Usually it's just a couple pa pages. This was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So this is a beautiful, easy to do. Um, and it's, it's very cheap to buy. So if you want something like that, but the, the, to me, the PSO de Resistance is the, the hardcover. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. It's it's something that like should be on a coffee table. It's just so exquisite. Yeah, I have it. I reviewed it. It's fantastic. And it's the textbook. It's the textbook now for the seed oil topic and all the other uh, you know, um issues surrounding the uh, you know, chronic disease, uh, metabolic disease oh, uh, epidemic. There are over thirteen hundred uh, um references that we we oh night after night day, months and months and months and months looking and searching and um certainly a labor of love you oh, and uh, dr chris are motivated by love for your fellow uh human beings and you know that's what has to motivate good science and good research is love it's so, uh, and, and we're truth seekers david we, we we really want to tell the truth it's not about we don't make money anything that i share with you anything i write with you anything chris talks about um, anything I post about, if I say this is something that we eat, I, we're not making any money off anybody. Yeah. I will never give you a link and say, you know, we'll get 10% or 50%. No, I believe in what we're telling you. I don't want to make money. I, I'm very, I'm very simple. I don't, I, I live on very little bit. Um, and um, I just want to, I want everyone to be healthy and happy. I want us to live as we were designed to live. I want us to live like the wild animals do. They don't have disease. They don't have, they're not losing their teeth. You know, I mean, when I look at our, my raccoons, it's that their teeth were gorgeous. I mean, the, the, the skunks, everything was just beautiful. They weren't falling out. And you look at people's dogs now and they're all falling out because why? Yeah, you know, your country's in trouble when the humans are, in, are, are envious of the raccoons' teeth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all about teeth. It's like, <laughs> I love, I just love how our teeth are. And, and yeah. And that's one thing I will be looking at within the tribes next week and in, in the next few weeks, I will be looking at their mouth and their bone structure and their mandible, you know, is it the wider from, from, from all how they live? You know, um, there's just so much. Is that just going to be like, you just kind of, kind of seeing it or you guys not, you're not going to do like, like clinical measurements and that kind of thing. Or well, <laughs> I'm kind of bold. <laughs> if my daughters were here, they'd say, Oh my gosh, she really is too bold. I will ask, I will ask if they wouldn't mind if I could take a gander in their mouth. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see, you know, if are they, is there a full set of teeth in there, you know, and, um, because, and, and just to just to go back to the big picture view for those who are asking, well, why are they doing all this? They're trying to document. And I probably should have emphasized this a little bit more at the beginning of this part of the discussion. They're trying to document the last remaining um, population groups that have um, stayed away largely from the processed foods and seed oils that are now become so global and ubiquitous. And they're trying to measure, and this is not going to be the full extent of their measurements. This is just the initial stage. They're trying to document while they still can the last remaining population groups that have not been eating seed oils and other processed foods, and then compare them to their genetic cohorts in their communities nearby that are eating the uh, conventional seed oil foods and then to see to finally be able to have scientifically documented uh, evidence about the damage effects or you know what is really going on with the introduction of processed grain seed oils and processed sugars yeah it's 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 remarkable and i i pray that when we get there it's going to be still these remote tribes living right. ancestrally and that they haven't fallen. So she's not just, I just want to be clear. She's not just saying, I'm going to look, ask people to look at teeth, like some kind of curiosity. It's also part of what drives it, but it's more about literally we've got to be able to have some hard scientific population studies that can help save the world from these afflictions of seed oils. Because unfortunately the way the system, the centralized, you know, scientific, you know, funding and research industry is, it's highly, you know, it's highly gated, it's highly uh, centralized, it's politically protected, and you've really got to be able to develop some really solid science while you still can 
of populations that have not been exposed by these seed oils and other processed foods um, so that you can make the best case possible to get rid of these things. Because I, I am someone who does not believe in having government intervene in, in our lives. But on this matter, because of what they did to introduce it to the public and subsidize it with our money and push it on the world, I believe that if we're going to ban something, we should ban seed oils and then have an intermediary, you know, have a transitional period where people, you know, because you don't want to destroy mom and pop restaurants. So you'd have to have a transition phase. But I think that we should push for a political uh, response, which is ultimately to ban these seed oils for human and animal consumption and just give a phase out window period for people to adjust. And I mean, you know, it, it would be hard and it'd be difficult, but it's not any worse. It's actually catastrophically hard if we continue on the path that we are of poisoning the world with seed oils. So that's why this scientific investigation that they're going to be embarking on is so important because there's no special interest money to support scientific population studies of the damages of seed oils. Uh, there's no money for that. So this is truly a grassroots, uh, you know, true scientific uh, endeavor. And I mean that in the true sense of the word, because science should be oriented towards the truth, not what is financially convenient for those who fund much of science today. So we applaud what you guys are doing. And we, you know, hope that you guys will be, have a wonderful, fulfilling trip and get as much data and insights as possible and hopefully be able to find communities that are still isolated from seed oils so that we can have the concrete hard evidence showing what health effects have been caused by the introduction of these non-food chemicals into the human diet and animal diet for pets. So we applaud what you're doing and I'm excited to see the, the journey you guys document and in the meantime, folks can check out your book and order it today, The Ancestral Health uh, a Diet Revolution. There it is, Ancestral Diet Revolution. Order it now because that's got all the data you need to, to investigate this matter exhaustively. And it's very, you know, it's like, a, it's like a textbook. You can kind of reference where you need to go. You don't have to read it cover to cover the first time. You can dive into the data that you need specific to the issue that you're trying to deal with. So that's very convenient. So uh, there it is right there. And uh, Susie, I appreciate what you guys are doing. And uh, um, I want you guys to, you know, know that we're going to be uh, praying for you guys and, and uh, following your work with great interest and looking forward to hear what you share and see what you guys share on your journey. So uh, Godspeed on your travels, and we look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you. Thank you. You're a dear friend. I love you, dear boy. Thank you. Very good. Take care. Bye, everybody.